Man, wasn't that good? That was fantastic. I kept my shoes on the whole time through the, uh, through the entire song. That was, uh, that was a real uh, feat for me. So Galatians chapter 5, thank you all for that song. Galatians chapter 5 this evening. And it's been a good day in the house of the Lord, hasn't it? And we're thankful for the two this morning that accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Savior. And uh, it's always a treat and always a blessing. And we certainly never want to take that for granted. Galatians chapter 5, and if you found your place, uh, stand with me if you are able for the reading of the Word of God. Galatians chapter 5, we're going to read just two verses tonight. Galatians chapter 5, just two verses this evening. Verse number 16 and verse number 17. Galatians chapter 5, verse number 16 and verse number 17. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusteth against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary the one to the other, so that ye cannot do the things that ye would. Look at verse 16. Just let's read it again for sake of emphasis. This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you this evening for your word, and I pray that you would use your word in our lives. I pray that you would rather convict us by your word and your spirit, and I pray that you would give us the courage to correct those areas in our life that you point out to us. May we learn to walk in the Spirit. May we be Spirit-filled Christians. In your son's name we pray. Amen. Thank you for standing. You may be seated. If I was going to give you a tagline for the sermon tonight, it would simply be this. Don't be tied up, be tied in. Don't be tied up, be tied in. How is it that we can be tied into what the Spirit is desiring to do in our hearts and our lives? How can we walk in the Spirit? It's, it's two things. It's a command and it's a promise. Verse 16. Walk in the Spirit, that's the command, and here is the promise. And ye shall not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Right? So if you, if you really want to, want to grasp or wrap your mind around verse 16, it's a command and it is a promise. It, the command, be filled or, or walk in the Spirit. And if you walk in the Spirit, the promise, that you will not then fulfill the lust of the flesh. So how can we walk in the Spirit? How are we supposed to walk in the Spirit? What does walking in the Spirit mean? Well, well to, to understand what walking in the Spirit implies, we should see what we're up against. Look at, look at verse number 7 of chapter number 5. Ye did run well. Who did it hinder you that ye should not obey the truth? Okay, so in competition with walking with the Spirit, we have this distraction. You, you were doing so good. That's what the Apostle Paul is saying. You were doing so good. So, so who distracted you from doing what it was that you were doing because you, what you were doing was so good? Okay, so you have this distraction. Look at verse number 13. For brethren, ye have been called unto liberty only... Use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but to love and serve one another. So here in this passage, in verse 17, you have this disaster. You, you've been called to liberty, but you've used this liberty as occasion to the flesh. What is, what is, what is the flesh? Well, he gives us the list. Verse number 19, now these are the works of the flesh. And then this long list, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, and the list goes on. Okay, so distraction, disaster. Look at verse number 15. You have this disorder. But if ye bite and devour one another. Okay, so 
What's stacked against us? What's keeping us from walking in the Spirit? Well, we're, we're distracted. There are individuals or things or entertainments in our life that get in our way, that distract us, that sidetrack us from walking in the Spirit. There, there is also this personal disaster where we've made poor choices in our lives and we've given ourselves to occasion to the flesh. That's what he says here. Use not this liberty for occasion to the flesh. But, but then there's also this, this biting, this devouring, this disorder. Well, he said, and she said, and I heard, well, I know something about them. And if, I, if you only knew what I knew, then you wouldn't. Uh-oh. Okay, so the disorder sets in. Look what happens here. And then there is this destruction. Take heed that ye be not consumed one with the other. Okay, so, so you're biting, devouring. It's, it's going in a circle. It's going in, and now you're constantly consumed. With, there's nothing else that you can think of except this problem or except this thing or except this person. And it keeps us from walking in the Spirit. So we, get, we get distracted, we get sidetracked, we get focused on this or focused on that. We, we're given occasion to the flesh where we made poor choices in life and we did things that we wish we could take back but that we can't. And then there's this disorder that sets in where everybody's pointing at everybody else. And then there's this constant consuming where all we can think about is what they're doing or not doing and it's on our mind and it's in front of our faces and it's in front of our eyes all the time. So even when we come to church, where we are doing something religious, we sit there and we are consumed with the person across the aisle. All these things keep us from doing verse 16. What is verse 16? This I say then. Okay, so the, the phrase, this I say then, the way you can understand that phrase is, instead of choosing to live that way, Instead of choosing to live that way, this is the way you should live. Instead of choosing to bite and devour and be consumed and be distracted and, and have these regrets that you, that you wish, just wish you could undo the last several months of your life, and, and instead of being given over to distraction and worried about this and worried about her and worried about him and what they say and if you only knew, instead, this I say then, walk in the spirit command and in the promise and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. All these things are warring against me. All these things are warring against you. He tells us that in verse number one. Would you look at the passage of scripture? Verse one. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. So, so all these things, this distraction, this disaster, this disorder, this destruction, these things are warring against me. They are warring against you. And what he's saying is don't entangle yourself in them. Why? Because Christ has made us free. Because Christ has made us free. So we've been, we've been made free in Christ in that we are no longer slaves to sin and that we are no longer slaves to the devil and that we are no longer slaves to this corrupted nature. We've been made free. So don't go entangle yourself again in the things that God has set you free from. And instead, walk in the Spirit. Now, now just listen to the implication. Christ has set us free. So these things are not in me. They do not own me. I do not belong to them. Christ has set me free from them. And yet it is possible for me to entangle myself in them. So they are not, they're no longer in me, but they are present with me. They are around me. Okay, so, so several things. How else then can we walk in the Spirit how can we walk in the Spirit? Well, first, there is a delusion to be rejected. A delusion to be rejected. Here's what, he, here's what he does not say. If you want to walk in the Spirit, then all you must do is do better. 
Is that what he said? If you want to walk in the Spirit, if you want to be free, just do good and do better, and then you will be free. This is the main difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. See, every other religion in the world says you are entangled in sin, you are entangled in a mess, and the only way you can get away from the mess or the only way you can get yourself free is for you to somehow have enough good works or do enough good deeds in order to untangle the web that you have weaved for yourself. And if you cannot untangle this web that you've worked yourself into by the time that your life ends, well, guess what? Too bad for you. Too bad for you. And Christianity, here's the message of Christianity. Christ has set you free. You haven't done one thing, and yet Christ has set you free. You've not yet walked in the Spirit, and yet Christ has set you free. We are set free free because of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for us. When he left heaven, when he was born of a virgin, when he lived a perfect sinless life, when he died on that cross, on that day, and then when they put him in the grave, three days later, he walked out of the tomb. Like, actually, physically, really walked out of the tomb. Not metaphorically, not ideologically, but that he physically walked out of the tomb, beating death, hell, and the grave. And then he offers to us this life, and he says, believe on me, and you will be free. Believe on me, and your sins can be forgiven. This is the offer from Christ. There's no one else in the world that would ever make that kind of an offer to you or to me, and yet that is the offer that Christ gives us in the gospel. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. He set us free because he decided to love us. Decided to love you. He decided to love me. And he set us free. You were tangled and yet Christ has freed you. But can I ask you a question? Is the experience of your Christian life one that is described as walking in the Spirit? If you walk in the Spirit, do you see what you will experience? Verse number 22. This is where I want to get to in a couple weeks, but to set it up, we're talking verse 16, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh and the affections and the lust. Lust, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. If we are believers, if we live in the Spirit, let us also then walk in the Spirit. Can your last week or the past month of your life, can it be described as love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance? I I wish mine could be described that way. Is yours described that way? The the delusion to be rejected is thinking that in somehow, in some way, by human regulation, that you can do what only can be done through divine transformation. Effective Christian living is not a product of human regulation, but it is a product of divine transformation. It is, it is possible for us to be committed to outward change in our habits without ever having experienced an inward change in our heart. And if that is what we are committed to, it will be to our detriment and it will be to our frustration. So we'll we'll spend all this energy and all this effort in trying to conform outwardly and yet the inward man is far from Christ. It is possible to have a head knowledge of Jesus Christ. It is possible to have an intellectual understanding of God. It is possible to know the words of the scripture and still not have had a divine transformation in your heart. Even the devils, James says, believe and tremble. Even the devil believes and trembles. Effective, authentic Christian living. 
walking in the Spirit is not a product of human regulation, but of divine transformation. One of the possible explanations for why you are not living, or, or rather why you are not walking in the Spirit, is perhaps you are living under a delusion. It's a delusion that simply because you know about God, and simply because you come to church, or simply because you have been religious, or simply because you can do all the things required for a religious lifestyle, simply because you've been able to change a few habits, that that has somehow empowered you to walk in the Spirit. So there is a delusion that is to be rejected, but there is also a dual nature that is to be recognized. Here's what he says, this I say then, walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. So he's talking to Christians. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. This is what the Bible teaches us, that every Christian has two natures. There is a flesh, it's what he calls it here. There is a sinful nature, and then there is the spirit. That's not spirit as in little s, like I just don't have the spirit today. I don't feel up to it today. It's spirit, capital S, as in the Holy Spirit. Because so there is the Holy Spirit that resides in you as a believer, but then the Holy Spirit is warring with your flesh. Or the word that they use in this passage, verse 17, is the word lusteth. It's, it's at battle against. It's contrary to. There is a war taking place. You, if you're a believer, you actually have two sides to yourself. If you, if you want to see that on display, read Romans chapter number 7. Well, Paul says, the things that I would not, those I do, and the things that I w would, those I do not. I, and I can't seem to set, set it straight, because every time I try to do the stuff that I know I ought to do, it seems like I never do it. And every time I do the stuff that I know I don't want to do, I feel really bad. What, what's happening inside of me that I, I can't get this thing figured out, and I haven't been able to master it? Well, it's simply because this, you are spiritually bipolar. Some of you are actually bipolar. But all of us are spiritually bipolar. There is, there is a side of you that still wants to live for itself. There is a side of you that desires to live for God. And there is this war that takes place inside of each and every one of us. And that is taking place inside of us right now. Like at this very moment. There is a war inside of our members, and there is this battle that is taking place in these two natures, this, this, this sinful nature, the flesh as it's referred to here, and then there is the spiritual nature, the Holy Spirit as it's referred to here. Okay, so, so let me help you understand this. Here is the moment of conversion for you. The moment you accepted the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit came into your heart, and he took up residence inside of your heart so that you've been given a new nature. You've been made someone new. And Christ set you free from the penalty and from the punishment of sin. So that when Christ, or rather when God, looks at Dave Delaney, he does not see Dave Delaney in all the sin, but that he sees the Lord Jesus Christ in my place. So he loves me and he pours out his, his grace and his mercy and his kindness and his favor to me. Because when he sees me, he doesn't see all my sin and all my mistakes. He's forgiven that and he sees Jesus Christ, the moment of conversion. There's this moment of conversion and then there is the moment of glorification in which we will be absolutely, totally perfect. No bad feelings, no bad thoughts, no bad words, no, no bad inclinations, no bad affections. We will be absolutely, totally perfect. How many of you are there? This moment does not happen until you are no longer breathing oxygen down here. Which means... Or you kicked the bucket, or you bought the farm, or you drove the car off the cliff, or whatever, however, whatever analogy you want to use there, okay? So moment of conversion, glorification, and everything in the middle of this, right, Everything in the middle of this is where this war is taking place. It's where this battle is going on. It's where this dual nature is, is warring with itself. 
The reason we have anxiety is because of the flesh. The reason we have fear is because of the flesh. The reason we have terrible relationships is because of the flesh. The reason we have difficulty in marriage is because of the flesh. The reason we can't get along with other people is because of the flesh. The reason we won't submit to our boss at work is because of the flesh. The reason we swell up with pride and recoil is because of the flesh. For the Bible says there is a war in you, and that war is between the flesh and the spirit, and it is taking place right now, and they are contrary one to the other. Distraction, disorder, disaster, destruction, all of that happening inside of us right now at this very moment and at every moment, and it cannot destroy you, but what the Apostle Paul says is it can entangle you. I need Brother Michael to come up here for a second. It can entangle you. All right, Brother Michael, hold this. We might have need some more thread. I'm not for sure. Stand, stand right here. That was not in the spirit. That was not walking in the spirit. Christ has set, good thing is, I'm not going to get too dizzy. Christ has set him free, and yet what we do when we give way to the flesh is we entangle ourselves. That's what he says. We entangle ourselves in what Christ has set us free from. So Michael is free from sin, and yet he's tying himself up in sin. Michael is free from the list in verse uh, 17, or verse 18, verse 19. He's free from it. God forgave him for it. God, set him, God gave him the power to beat it, and yet he's choosing to entangle himself in it. He's tying himself up. And, and this is what we do. We, we make just really poor choices. Oh, I'm getting really tired. We make really poor choices in our life. Gabriel, come here and do this. I've got to finish this sermon. <laughs> Keep walking. Tie them up really good. And, and what we do is we entangle ourselves over and over and over again from the thing that Christ set us free from. You, we've been set free. So why are we going to entangle ourselves again? It's, just like, it's almost like a no-brainer. Christ set us free from this, and yet, thank you, and yet we've decided to tangle ourselves up in it. Watch this. Look at the end of verse 17. Would you look at this phrase with me? So that you cannot do the things that you would. Have, have, has there been a time in your Christian life where you go, I just wish I could, if I could only, if I would only? Well, the reason you cannot do the things that you would spiritually is because you've got yourself all tied up spiritually. And when you got yourself all tied up, that was your choice. Because Christ set you free from this. He freed you from every bit of it. And yet you tied yourself up in it. It's, it's, it's what um, some of you would understand as muscle memory. Everybody understand the phrase muscle memory? When you do something for so long with your body or your muscles or your lack of muscles there, uh, which, whichever it is for, for you, lack of muscles in my case, if you do something with your body for so long in a certain way, it becomes second nature to you to just continue to use your muscles that way. So I like to play softball and baseball when I was growing up. And so we went the other day with Brother Rice and Brother Michael and Brother Tim Eggy, and we went out to play golf, and muscle memory kicked in. And every time I swing a golf club, I swing a golf club the way I swung a baseball bat. Now, I haven't swung a baseball bat in forever. But for whatever reason, whenever I go to swing a golf club, and I even know you're supposed to, you know, lock your pinky and you're, and, and you're supposed to do this number, and every time I swing a golf club, muscle memory kicks in, and I swing that golf club the same way that I used to swing a baseball bat. It's just, just the muscles doing what, they're, what they think they're supposed to do. So, so muscle memory happens, and finally, Brother Rice couldn't take any more of it. And he literally... I mean, he doesn't have much hair, but the hair that he had, he was pulling out, and he literally says, this is it, I, I got to help you, and this is going to be, you're going to be a very difficult person to help. I said, right? <laughs> My wife says the same thing. <laughs> he says, you used to play baseball, and I said, yeah, like a long time ago, he goes, oh boy, oh boy. 
He basically says, don't do anything like you used to do it. What? Now what? Now I'm like Charles Barkley out there trying to swing the golf club. Like it just, it looks terrible. It looks crazy. Why? Because my muscles are used to doing a certain thing in a certain way, and now when I'm doing a similar thing, those muscles kick in and they want to run the same way, or lack of muscles, whatever it happens to be. It takes intentional effort in order to not swing the baseball or the golf club the way that I used to swing the baseball bat. Do you understand the illustration? Do you understand the analogy? Some of us have grown very accustomed to doing life a certain way to thinking certain thoughts, to responding in a certain way, to answering our critics in a certain way, to, to snapping off with the tongue in a certain way. Some of us have grown very accustomed to doing life in a certain way, and yet Christ has freed us from that, and when we respond with muscle memory, we entangle ourselves all over again. That's what he says. Third, and last, a deliberate action is required. Would you look at verse number 25 with me? If we live in the Spirit, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us also, it's like a, make, a, make a conscious choice so if we live in the Spirit, make a conscious choice, let us also walk in the Spirit. Lee Robertson, a pre famous preacher of decades gone by, used to say it this way, are you right now filled with the Spirit? See, the average Christian thinks, well, the real problem in my life is all these bad desires, all these bad things. And if I could somehow get rid of all these bad desires, if I could somehow get rid of all these bad things, then I wouldn't do all these bad things, and then I wouldn't be a bad person. If I could somehow squash all these bad habits, all these bad desires, all these external influences, if I could somehow squash all these things or get away from them or isolate myself far enough from him, then somehow in some way I wouldn't do bad things. But that's not what the Apostle Paul is saying. The Apostle Paul says, the problem is not that you are not free from them, no, you're free. The problem is you've entangled yourself in them again, and the reason you got yourself entangled was because you were not walking in the Spirit. Muscle memory was kicking in, and you were just doing what was comfortable, what was natural, what was second nature. When the Apostle Paul says walk in the Spirit, another way you can understand that phrase is keep step with the Spirit. Keep step with the Spirit. It's a picture of, of going on a long walk or a long run with someone where every stride is the same stride. Right foot, right foot, left foot, left foot, right, left, right, left. You keep in step. Remember what I told you to begin with? It's not tied up. Damn, let me have these things. It's not tied up. It's tied in, right? All right, so we're going to un undo Brother Michael here. We're going to set him free. Yeah, I'm going to make you get dizzy. There we go. This will be fun. This will be very interesting. How you doing? I'm getting dizzy. What would you get for lunch? We're gonna, are we going to see it in a minute? Let's hope we don't see. <laughs> all right, good. I should have thought about this illustration before I actually got them all tied up. But anyway, whatever, we're in it now. <laughs> Are we good? No. All right, now run to first base. No, I'm just teasing. <laughs> All, right. All right, come down here with me, Brother Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Walk down these five steps <laughs> and take a breathalyzer test. All right, come down here. All right, come down here. Now, can everybody see me still? It's not, it's not tied up. Watch. It's tied in. Put your foot next to mine. There we go. Hold on one second. Yeah. This might be a minute. How y'all doing? Good. It's 
It's not tied up. It's tied in. How do we live the Christian life? Well, entangle not yourself with what Christ has set you free from, but tie in. Remember the three-legged races you used to do when you were a little kid? Were you any good at that? We're about to find out if Michael and I were any good at it. <laughs> well, let's, just, let's, walk, let's walk that way. Yeah, there we go. Ooh, look at that. Oh, we can take anybody in the church right now. Yeah, this is good. Let's turn back this way. Oh, you want to run? You want let's to. Do, let's run. Let's run. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, it's not tied up. Ow, man. It's not tied up. I need a knife. I, was somebody cut me free from this guy. It's not tied. It's not tied up. <laughs> Did he pull that? I, can I trust you? Yeah, all right, go ahead. It's not tied up. Thank you, Brother Mike. It's not tied up. It's tied in. So here's my question for you tonight. Are you tied in? Are you tied in? Or have you tied yourself up? The disorder, the distraction, the chaos, the devouring one of another, the being consumed with what everybody else is doing, what everybody else is thinking, where everybody else is going. What? Or are you saying, I'm walking in the Spirit. I'm tied into taking step after step after step with the Holy Spirit of God. Are you right now, right now, filled with the Spirit? When you go to work tomorrow, will you be filled with the Spirit? I wonder if you'd have enough courage tomorrow morning before you jump on the expressway or hit the office. I wonder if you'd have enough courage to just take a minute and say, God, Fill me with your spirit. I pray that I would respond the way you want me to, to whatever comes throughout the day. I pray that my lips would say only what you want me to say. I pray that my hands would do only what you want my hands to do. And I want to walk step in step with what you're doing today. I wonder if you'd have enough courage to say that. Would you? I think our offices would be different places. I think our cities would look different. Our churches would look different. Our relationships would be different. If we walk in the Spirit. Let's stand together for prayer, shall we?